Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I also thank Leader Proctor for inviting me and also for extending the break by 15 minutes, so especially before a topic like this, so that food can move on on its way. Um, I'm going to start with a case that got me into this field, though I have some disclosures. <clears throat> this was um, a patient I saw in clinics. She was a 61-year-old woman referred for evaluation of chronic diarrhea for eight months. When I first saw her, she already was eight months into the course. Her symptoms originally started following treatment with cephalosporin and quinolone antibiotics for back surgery and some pulmonary infection. During these eight months, she had several hospitalizations for IV hydration. In the documentation, the, um, the diagnosis was not entirely clear for, from the history. Uh, with her colonoscopy showed ischemic colitis on biopsies, which can actually be seen with C. difficile infection, which undoubtedly this is what it was. Intermittently, she was treated with variable success with metronidazole and vancomycin. She had bowel movements when I saw her in clinic every 15 minutes with urgency and tenesmus. She lost 27 kilograms of weight by that time and was simply living in the chair, in the wheelchair. Um, so I've been doing this fecal transplant work for a couple of years now and my sense of humor, sensitivity may have gotten blunted. So hopefully this will, uh, the next slide will work. Anyway, what, what, um, this is the pathophysiology of, of recurrent C. difficile infection syndrome. Um, mm -hmm. This really is a, a syndrome as the incidence of C. difficile infection has increased and new toxigenic and more virulent strains have emerged, the morbidity and mortality with this infection has increased about fourfold. And the um, recurrent syndrome is one of the most difficult challenges that we face in clinic. The overview of, of pathophysiology is fairly simple, our understanding. So antibiotics will, uh, this is what normal is, there's obviously microbes there. Uh, antibiotics will decrease the density and alter the composition of the microbiota. That provides a window of opportunity for spores to come in, which is usually the way it's acquired. And then the uh, vegetative forms of bacteria grow up, produce toxin. That results in pseudomembranous colitis in at least some patients, or variable symptoms and syndromes that present that may not be necessarily as severe. You treat that with antibiotics, and you hope to come back here, but in these recurrent C. difficile infection uh, patients, the cycle just keeps repeating because you're never quite able to break, break the loop. And so the, um, the solution, which has uh, its own history that goes fairly far uh, in the past, um, is to administer the normal microbes back and reconstitute. So as I said, my sense of uh, humor may have, uh, may have changed, so hopefully this will go okay. This is the mechanistic version of uh, what we do, at least um, a couple years back. So we need a donor. This man has bad poop. It used to be good poop and fast. And we need to take their good poop and put it into the other patient in place of the bad poop. This will save his life for some reason. I'm a doctor. <laughs> Actually, the doctor that, that uh, is often credited, at least in Western medicine, with doing this was no slouch. Uh, was Dr. Ben Eisman um, was chief of surgery at the time of the publication of the first paper that's usually cited in 1958 at the Denver VA Hospital at age of 36 or so, which is younger than most people get their R01 these days. I was a founding chairman of surgery at a couple of institutions, had a very active academic life, wrote more than 450 scientific articles, published seven books, including one book that came out very close to his death on the care of the aged. He was uh, participated in four 
wars and active duty, was a rear admiral uh, in the Navy, he retired in 1974. He was an active academic through 2012 when he passed away. And we actually did have a communication from him, and that's what he said in an email. In the early days of oral antibiotics, we were plagued by frequent diarrhea in our patients due presumably to killing off intestinal bacteria. I was chief of surgery at the VA and simplistically considered merely in reintroducing normal organisms to counter such absence. Those were days when one, if one had an idea, we simply tried it. it. Seemed to work and I wrote it up, made a small splash. Best wishes. Um, this was before uh, the, uh, the uh, FDA started regulating the drugs, before the agency appeared. So the technique goes back uh, in Western medicine into the 50s, in Chinese medicine, probably fourth century or so. So this was uh, back to the case. Uh, I thought, if we're going to do something like that, we better study it, since that's one thing that hasn't been done through all those years. And so we collected uh, fecal material before, as well as the donor. The donor in this case was her husband of 40-some years and after. And this uh, material headed off to Sweden, where Janet Jansen helped us to do TRFLP analysis, which is what this was. Uh, and it was published as a case report back in 2010. So this is uh, the patient on day minus seven, and you can just look at it as a barcode. Uh, this was at the time of the procedure. The material was introduced by colonoscopy. Looks a little different, but I think it's probably because the colonoscopy itself uh, changes things and there's stuff coming out from small bowel and into the colon. This was just an aspirate. That's uh, the donor material on day zero. And this is the patient two weeks after and then one month after. So there's a fairly striking resemblance between the donor and, and the recipient, which quite quickly led to the acceptance of the notion that this procedure results in complete engraftment that is stable and, and uh, donor-like. Um, so part of the uh, notion here is, is um, these patients that get these multiple infections, and that's, I think it's an important point, they get carpet bomb with antibiotics. And the patient that, that I presented, she was ill for eight months, and it was another seven months before I did that procedure, so it was over a year. And I talked to IRB and all that, and in the, in the meantime, I thought I could get her out with antibiotics. But that, on our average patient gets a year of antibiotics, which is an incredible pressure on the gut microbiota. And this is kind of reflected here. So we're looking at a handful of controls. This is back from 2008. Uh, people with initial C. diff infection, as well as people with recurrent C. difficile infection. And you look at the uh, diversity of microbiota or bacterial species, and it doesn't take much work to reach a plateau for those with recurrent disease, because there isn't much left. Uh, compared to controls, and the, the ones that have the initial infection are somewhat intermediate. Um, this is more recent data, and we have a poster here that's presenting this. So this is a collection of 14 uh, patients. We have donors over here. Um, these are recipients. The sample's taken usually a couple days before the procedure, and then about a week afterwards. Um, these are actually two donors, but they're um, sampled on different days. Uh, we're looking at 16S. Uh, ribosome RNA gene profiling. Um, so as you can see, as you would expect, they're dominated by the two major phyla, Firmicutes and Bacteroidetes. And the proteobacteria is just little, this tiny red band here, which is what you would expect. Our patients, however, proteobacteria expand and become dominant. Um, and I don't actually think this is uh, completely benign as you know, when we look at the species here, it's all the kinds of things that infectious disease doctors know. 
which is probably not a good sign. They're Proteus, Klebsiella, E. coli, Enterobacter, things like that. And sometimes these patients, after having these, this antibiotic pressure for a long time, start running into other infections which would caused by these organisms. Bladder infection, for example, is a common one, and it assumes its own recurrence cycle. And then the two infections start playing tag team with each other. Um, anyway, then shortly after the procedure, this is about one week after, it looks essentially donor-like. If we uh, look at the family, I'll just call attention to uh, these proteobacteria here that fall into the enterobacteriaceae family, which is where those pathobionts are, are found. If we do uh, look at diversity, these are our donors. That's our recipients, markedly reduced diversity, as you would expect, and then that quickly reconstitutes after the procedure. By PCA plots, it does support that original case report. The um, um, patients before the procedure fall into their own cloud here. The donors and recipients afterwards are not distinguishable. And you saw a version of this uh, when Rob Knight presented a movie that it was when we were sampling uh, patients daily, and it was uh, uh, kind of similar. They, they shifted toward the donor, and then each patient, each recipient, settled in their own little cloud close to the donor, but not quite the donor. There's still some individual fingerprint left. So what about the yuck factor? That's what uh, journalists like to talk about, and it piques certain attention. I actually don't want to talk about it. Because um, that's what it looks like for me at this point. And this is frozen material in a cryo bag. Uh, at this time, we just use uh, rigorously tested volunteer donors. We're aware of the scientific literature that ties microbiota to all kinds of problems. So we do screen and test for not just infectious disease, but for metabolic syndrome neurologic disorders, autoimmune problems. We are basically looking for Greek gods. Um, the material can be cryopreserved. Some of these tests trickle in uh, in days, weeks, sometimes a month. So all the tests have to be uh, to satisfy all those. Those constitute release criteria for when this material is ready for use. Um, this material actually virtually has no donor. It passes through a bunch of filters, it's washed. The microbes are there, but the, uh, they, they're not actively producing hydrogen sulfide or whatever makes the smell. Um, we've, we've standardized it, so there's the same number of bacteria, at least per dose. We look at viability by membranes, uh, permeability and such. And this material is now manufactured under GMP conditions at an FDA registered site at the university. So I can be courageous about this. All right. So what are, how does it actually work? It sounds simple, but you have to study it a little bit, and it's not necessarily that. This, this picture is from a wonderful little children's book written by Dr. Arthur Kornberg, Nobel Prize winner, and illustrated by Adam Alanitz. Um, so that's my view of microbiota. So they could work directly inhibit C. difficile, or they could work somehow through a host loop to, to do the same. And C. difficile has a number of steps to go through to cause its problems. Sporulate, spores have to germinate, has to be vegetative growth, adhesion to epithelial cells, toxin production are some of them. And on the host side, there could be a number of factors that affect C. difficile cycle, including um, immune system, short-chain fatty acids, bile acids, as we've heard about already. Um, competitive niche exclusion, this comes from the same book. I wish we actually knew what the, uh, the niche was and how narrowly it's defined for C. difficile, but I don't think we do. So I, for looking for some figure, I reached into my immunolo immunology past when I used to think about things like that in lymphocyte homeostasis where normally you have a lot of T-cell clones, and they, def they exist in a particular uh, space of lymphoid tissue, and they either have unique resources, which is T-cell receptor, or 
common resources, for example, cytokines like IL-7 and IL-15. There could be a lymphopenia-inducing insult, uh, viral infection or um, radiation or whatever, and that results in death of many clones. And if you're young enough, if you have a thymus, you can recover back to normal diversity. If you don't, the best you can do is at least re-expand and reoccupy the space with what you have left. Uh, but life is not necessarily that simple, so here's an autoimmune-looking clone that gets extra TCR stimulation, and under these conditions, it can expand out and cause autoimmune disease. So you have a link between lymphopenia, which is kind of paradoxic, and autoimmunity in this case. One can think through the same kind of logic if this is a microbe and then antibiotics, et cetera, except we don't know what the mediators are. Um, there could be more direct interaction, not just competition, but uh, direct killing of uh, C. difficile. So there's a paper on bactericin that was, that's found in, uh, from, manufactured by a normal constituent of gut microbiota, Bacillus thuringiensis, and it has very narrow activity against C. difficile. So if you compare that with metronidazole, metronidazole, of course, causes in a, in a uh, bioreactor um, bloom of proteobacteria, just like we saw in, in patients. Um, so major disruption of microbiota. And on the other hand, this other antibiotic that's derived from microbiota is much more narrow spectrum and doesn't cause nearly as much disruption. Uh, another idea is it, uh, illustrated in this paper. This was just an in vitro work. But this particular um, bacterium and strain is able to inhibit cytotoxicity as well as adhesion of C. difficile to uh, uh, epithelial cells. Uh, this is the uh, cytotoxicity assay. It happens to be a soluble uh, factor, and other strains could not do it. And then it also in inhibits this particular strain. Once again, this factor inhibits the uh, um, adhesion um, to epithelial cells of C. diff. But it does not affect the vegetative growth. So you can grow them together and they seem to grow fine, but the cytotoxicity is, is altered on the host. Uh, there could be immune-mediated colonization resistance. And this has been explored uh, just a little bit. And we, of course, we know many mechanisms that, that exist. Uh, antimicrobial peptides, for example. Uh, alpha defensins neutralize C. difficile toxin B. Perhaps that's why the small bowel is relatively protected against C. diff. It's a disease of the colon, because you have panic cells in the small intestine, but not really uh, in the colon. There could be other mechanisms. Uh, a lot of this is mouse work, uh, which has uh, joined the field with all the tools that it has. Um, and so. We know there's uh, a role for NOD1 and MITE88, and, and, and some of these, like IL-1, CXCL1, are dependent on microbiota being present to provide this colonization resistance. There's a role for um, adaptive immunity as well. We know that patients with recurrent C. difficile infection um, do not develop as high titers of antibody against C. difficile toxin, uh, although most of them don't really have a major immune defect. Like we know the, the common variable immune deficiency patients are prone to this condition, but the majority of patients don't have anything that's, that's that um, dramatic. And uh, our own focus uh, has been on, on bile acids. So this has been introduced before. Prior, primary bile acids that are made in the liver, and then they are uh, modified by microbiota in the colon. So you have this hydroxyl group at position 12, this one at 7, and you have a conjugation site that can get conjugated to amino acids like glycine and taurine. And it, um, here it is again. And I'll just point out that, for example, tauricolic acid, one of the main primary uh, bile acids produced, is a progerminant of C. difficile. It's like fertilizer, and I became uh, aware of it once we started growing it in the lab, and a light bulb went on. Um, and um, lithocolic acid, which is one of the secondary ones, 
is a known inhibitor of C. difficile germination. Um, if you look at germ-free mice versus conventionally raised mice, in germ-free mice you just see, as you would expect, only the primary bile acids in their fecal material, as all the secondary ones show up when, with conventionalization. Interestingly, I should know that when, when kids are born, they're nearly germ-free, and they primarily have the primary bile acids at first. And those newborns are highly colonized with C. diff. About 30 to 50 percent, you'll find C. diff in them. For some reason, they don't develop the clinical syndrome. Um, so there's actually some work done on role of bile salts in mice. Um, spore germination C. difficile, I'll quickly run through that. So in the lab, this is germination assay. Uh, you need toracolic acid to germinate C. difficile. Um, if you take in small intestinal contents, uh, there is some germination activity there, which is augmented by antibiotic clindamycin. On the other hand, if you take material washings from the colon, they don't have that germinant activity anymore unless the animal has been exposed to antibiotics. Um, and that's fecal pe pellets, even with clindamycin, don't work very well. This germination factor is small. It's heat stable, water soluble, sensitive to cholestyramine. Cholestyramine was used in the past um, as, as one approach to C. difficile infection. It was thought to bind up the toxin. It probably another role that should be considered is bile, binds up bile acids and salts. Um, again, as you might expect, there is uh, uh, primary bile acids are are the only ones seen in clindamycin treated animals, and um, when you look at these um, uh, assays, if, if you basically find that fecal bacteria block this progerminant activity of toracolic acid. So this is our own data again to the poster. We looked at fecal bile acid composition before and after the uh, fecal transplant. And before the procedure, again, these are patients that are bombarded with antibiotics for a long time. All we find is primary bile acids in their fecal material. Uh, after the procedure, they're gone. The pattern is completely reversed with secondary bile acids, deoxycholic acid, lithocholic acid, isodeoxycholic acid. So before the procedure, we don't find any secondary bile acids. Um, but afterwards, they come back and they're indistinguishable from the donor. So these are the same patients that I showed with the uh, uh, 16S data on. And then we actually also did uh, untargeted metabolomics uh, looking for in, in, on the fecal material. And lo and behold, the major things that drive the difference before and after were once again bile acids. Toracolic acid came up, um, uh, which is, of course, the, uh, the one of interest. So, you know, the summary we see the procedure is associated with increase in. Uh, lithocholic acid, which inhibits germination, and uh, decrease in toracolic acid, which uh, promotes it. Here's our little simple model. This would be normal situation where uh, primary bile acids are illustrated as green. They go through the small intestine, and here the microbiota convert them to secondary and turns color in this illustration. On the other hand, and you see a couple of C. diff spores that just can't do very much. Um, after antibiotics, this is what happens. You lose your secondary bile acids. Instead, your colon is sprayed with this fertilizer for C. diff, and you have a bloom of C. diff and its spores. So our current directions are further development of standardized full-spectrum microbiota for therapeutic transplantation. We're expanding our GMP manufacturing, no trivial task. Uh, and of course, we're interested in mechanism-based development of disease-targeted microbiota therapeutics. And for my own gaps and challenges, I thought I would bring up this issue, which is not new. And it's the challenge between basic science and translation. And I grew up scientifically in this world, and I love this world. It's so 
intellectually stimulating and linear in thinking, and you have all these tools to work with. Um, and it takes a lot of courage to cross this bridge, and this is the risk of what can happen, and wasn't easy to turn around my own uh, career. And then you come to this place, and there's a difference in infrastructure. Uh, one can sometimes see it in the, on the campus. We have these beautiful buildings that are called translational research, but there's not a single patient there. It's all mouse work. Uh, actually, what's happening in the clinics, and NIH cannot fix this, but it has to be sensitive to these realities, is the academic health centers are competing with private clinical entities. It's just trying, they're trying to survive, and their research priority is falling behind and there is not as much investment made into that. So while we have all this science being built in, in, the, in the basic sciences building, the infrastructure on the clinical side is still somewhat prehistoric and hasn't changed very much. And so we come to, the, to a place where science, instead of leading, is following whatever is happening within the field. In the fecal transplant example, you have physicians performing these procedures without any particular protocol um, or with some, and it just whatever happens, happens. Sometimes patients just do it themselves. All, these, all this knowledge and resources tossed aside. Well, we, I mean, one would think that this donor pool that we have that is going into patients should be considered a great resource to study. Uh, we are saving their samples and such, but there could be a whole bunch of biomarkers uh, that could be collected on them, and this material could go into a variety of studies, and there could be some biomarkers that will identify a particular composition that could be interesting in autism or diabetes or heart disease or whatever else that people are talking about here. This is kind of happening already. Uh, I receive emails daily from patients who are doing this procedure on themselves, for a variety of indications because they've heard about the science. It's usually not C. diff. They do it for IBS, they do it for rheumatoid arthritis, autism. It just sounds a little crazy, and I hope that somehow we can be in front of this pack and, and lead them with, uh, with scientific insight. So for acknowledgments, I particularly would like to highlight Alexa, who's done uh, all the work I've presented here and in her poster. This, of course, is a multidisciplinary science, um, and it's, that's been the most gratifying part of it, that I'm a clinician, immunologist, but now I work with mucosal, uh, sorry, with a microbial ecologist who studied all kinds of species in the woods and lakes and rivers and has not studied humans before, but now we're at the same team, uh, Chi Chen, uh, from food science and nutrition to our metabolomics. Um, Matt Hamilton is our current head of production <laughs> in the GMP uh, facility. And there are other collaborators. I mentioned Janet Jansen that helped us with the uh, first case. I think that's all I have. Thanks a lot, but because of the time constraint, we will take question in the open session. Our next speaker is Elaine Petrov from Queen's University, Canada, and the title of the talk is Use of Microbial Ecosystems to Treat Recurrent Clostridium Difficile Infection. Thank you. 